Okay, finally, I hope this is the last one. I've got some other related videos. I wanted to make one single video, and I'm on part four. This is my project finance lecture, the fourth part. I'm going through same kind of stuff. Sorry about this. I'm practicing, really. I want to go through this kind of speed in my uh, class. And, you know, I added, I think, one, one diagram. Somebody told me PPP stands for Perpetual Pending Projects. So I like that. Okay, now this... this uh, Video is about the the kind of last part of this stuff, which is the debt protections, and those debt protections are debt service. How about lockup covenants first, cash sweeps, and debt service reserve accounts? There's not much more you can do. It's all about chain adding a little liquidity to a project and 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 uh, limiting dividends. That's all it is. And people spend perhaps too much time on on some of these issues. And I want to make sure and emphasize in this uh, video, here's all our refinancing. Sorry, I'm going through it like this. Too bad. And here's all our credit spread. Oh, that was fun talking about. And floating and fixed rate uh, debt. I put MRA here, maintenance reserve account. And I'll talk a little about that. So here we have some of the things that cash flow capture a dividend lockup or a cash trap covenant. When the DSCR gets below a certain level, let's say 1.1, so if it's 1.09, there's a tiny little bit of tricking linked, little bitty, bitty but, uh, cash left. You can trap that cash and not allow a dividend. Cash sweep covenant. Ah, ah, this is when ah things are really good. The oil price is really high. You've got a really windy year. Don't let them pay all the dividends. Have them pre have them prepay some of the debt. Debt service reserve accounts. Make sure that the you've got a little cash in your bank account. So when you do something like I do and miss a plane because you sit in the wrong. Uh, 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 gate because you've got these headphones that I have on you know whatever you need some cash for bad times or perhaps just a father with a parent guarantee which is liquidated uh, uh, a letter of credit liquid li letter of credit here's an example I don't know where I picked this up from they had a target DSCR 1.2 that, that has nothing to do with a covenant then they had a lockup and they used the previous 12 months, thankfully, not the forward 12 months. It had to be greater than 1.1. An event of default, if the DSCR is below 1.05, so you're still actually paying the debt service, there's officially a default. It means almost nothing. You can go and negotiate something or other, I suppose. Default, I don't know. You can ask for your money back, but what are you going to do? The plant isn't working the way it was supposed to and then there's some standard covenants here's what a covenant can and cannot do I think that last point about the I had somebody from Japan and say what happens if you have a default and he said waiver 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 we give a waiver it was beautiful okay that's what happens when you have a default if you have a project finance you can't move you can't really change the way it works or anything else Covenants cannot, all this stuff cannot increase cash flow. Don't become overly enthusiastic about these covenants. All they can do, and they can't, if they don't have, if you don't have enough cash flow, you're going to have default. But, the, and they certainly cannot make a bad project into a good project. If you have a bad project, if the cash flow is less than that debt service, I don't think you should uh, make a, a, a debt investment, I don't think you should lend to that project. But they can change the timing of the dividends. And I put DSCR. Why can't I seem to say DSRA? They, uh, covenants, they, and I say covenants can force it in, or MRA, the, how we got covenants, comma, MRA. Uh, and DSRA can force 
liquidity into a project so you can make sure you have a little cash on hand. Now, the basic thing about project finance is we can't just have a silly little cash flow sweep every single time. Not silly little. A cash flow sweep when we never allow dividends until all the debt is paid off because then investors would have to wait 20 years maybe to get paid off the debt. They can't do that. They need a little bit of money. you you got to allow some dividends, but how you allow them is, is the tricky part. Okay. I think I said enough there. And here again, I'm re-emphasizing you could read this. Good. Okay. They can't, the structure cannot elevate the rating of a fundamentally weak project to investment grade levels. Good, that's a fancy way of saying you can't make a bad project into a good project. Now, a lot of this is about our wonderful cash flow waterfall. I, here's the d first debt. They turn a switch on and they, you should have a dam here that stops the cash flow and another dam that stops the cash flow and the trickling down here is the dividends and the action is around here. The action is what happens after you've paid the senior debt service. Can you stop this trickle and save that cash? Pump storage, pump it up. There should be a reservoir. This isn't actually a very good uh, uh, way to look at it, really, is it? I need to find a picture of a series of cascading cascade uh, dams. Okay. Now, in terms of modeling, first start with EBITDA, then take away debt service, then use a whole lot of subtotals I'm reading, but it's okay to read this. You use maximum when you want to test for positive or negative. You use minimum to cap something. Here's an example of taking some money, and a trustee is going to take this money. You're not, as an investor, the equity investor, you don't control the money, and they're going to allow some of it go to O&M uh, with certain limitations. Maybe you don't want to certain, then it goes to taxes, then it goes to interest, then it goes to a debt service reserve account. That should be a good way to make a nice kind of diagram of this, but I don't know how to do it really. So let's talk about the first one. This is an example of a lockup account. Okay, so if the DSCR is equal to, for the calendar 1.2 to 1, just 1.2, it should say, whatever. Preceding date. And the projected, oh, this is so horrible. Making a projection to figure out if you're allowed to make a dividend. You have to argue about a cash flow all the time. They make, better make sure they don't have it, know about anything bad to happening and all that stuff. So then you can distribute. So I call a cash lockup a bad time covenant. Bad time covenant. It stops dividends when they're, I'm reading this stuff. Okay. And if things are really getting bad, you don't have any cash left anyway. Might not do such a lot of good. Okay. And for programming, you know, if, if, if there's a, you just put a little true and false switch in there. Okay. And you just say, if the, it, it's like a, a little thing where the, the actual DSCR is greater than the covenant, then you put true and you allow a dividend. If it's false, you take and trap. You put in the cash flow waterfall a little line that says cash trapped, and that goes upstairs and is then put into a debt cert, into a reserve account. Okay. And then the, for cash sweeps, they're programmed a little bit differently. They're the good time covenant. And you have to use a max min, a classic max min. You say, well, we're only going to sweep if there's positive cash flow on some subtotal line. So we put a maximum comma zero, and then we make a minimum because you're not going to sweep if there's no debt left. It's a prepayment. A sweep is a, 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 a prepayment. Now, here's what the big point about cash sweeps, I hope, is they only make sense when you have volatile cash flow. Think about 2008 and some dramatic decline in cash flow and you've allowed dividends before. They, I would, as a lender, I would hate it. Oh no, I paid dividends and suddenly after 2008, before 2008, we paid, allowed them to pay dividends because that's what's in project finance. And after that, uh, default.
Wouldn't it have been better to sweep that cash and not allow the dividends? Then you would have paid off a lot more of the debt and you would have a less default. Now, if cash flow is always really low, there's nothing to sweep. It doesn't help. If cash flow is always really high, there's no need for a sweep. You see that sweeps are only make sense in the context of volatility. Okay, and how do we figure out? The interesting question is how do we now figure out the costs and the benefits of a sweep? And do we, are we overstating the cost? Are we understating the benefits? This is a risk-return kind of question. Here's my kind of diagram of 2008. Here's the cash flow. It declines. If we allow dividends here instead of prepaying the debt, and then it declines to below the debt service, the debt service is going up because we've defaulted. We've got to repay interest on the default. So first, this is, this is why the default's getting bigger. Now, hopefully, at the end, if you've got a tail, you can repay the default. But imagine if you would have had a sweep here, then the, the cash flow would have been going down and perhaps we would have never even had a default. Or if you would have allowed a bigger dividend or something, you know, less here, uh, kind of sculpted, I don't know, not sculpted, but whatever, some kind of cash flow where we would have had a bigger default, then we wouldn't have had enough to repay the default. That's what you should program, and you can watch other videos to do that. That's what you should program in a cash flow waterfall to be able to model what happens if you have a sudden decline in cash flow and you had a sweep versus no sweep. How much are you protecting yourself? Or you could get really fancy, which I have done in other videos and put Monte Carlo simulation because a sweep only makes sense in the context of volatility. I hope you saw the up and down was my Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, now what do I say? Economic. So here's what we do. Um, hmm. I think <laughs> that, well, I've already talked about the risk and benefits. And here's what I want to say. I, um, this is not a good slide, but the big point here is the sweeps should not be, you don't sweep when the DSCR is really low. You don't sweep when they're, uh, uh, they're low. You sweep when they're high. If you sweep when they're low, it's a redundant. It's the same as a cash trap covenant almost. I know there are different ways. A tr covenant, you put the cash flow in a reserve account and then maybe you switch it over to a sweep or something like that. Okay? All right. Uh, uh, if we're talking about a cash flow sweep, I say that if you just look at it from a kind of a, 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 a close-minded, not refinanced point of view, you see that, oh, no, it really kills the IRR. But if you're sweeping, you're paying off the debt faster. So why don't you refinance? And you could even refinance faster. And then suddenly the cost of the sweep is very, very different. Because if you could, you know, uh, uh, sweep the cash flow and then get a good loan, you know, a, a good long-term loan, you can use the proceeds from that loan to pay the dividend off. So if you could kind of, after a few years... Oh no. Oh no. I've got to I've got to uh, pause. Okay. So, let's talk about <laughs> I don't know how I was interrupted. Let's talk about the DSRA. It's there because of liquidity. Now sometimes I hear that it's these kind of things just get me. Oh, you better finance this DSRA with equity. Why? It's skin in the game. Who cares? You want it for liquidity. That's what it's there for. Understand why these things are there. Now, it's so expensive to have this DSRA. You think, ah, six months of debt service. It's a little bit of money. Who cares? But imagine a 90% uh, finance with debt and imagine a kind of high debt service, a fast repayment or high interest rate or something. And then... Since it's 90%, you have got a big, much bigger debt service, and then the equity is much smaller, 
that means a DSRA can have a surprisingly big effect. Now, sometimes you can use a letter of credit instead of cash. Now, I do not understand. I've heard sometimes people say you can use the letter of credit, and the letter of credit is signed by the project company itself. Well, if the project company is going bust, why would a bank sign a letter of credit that's backed up by the project company? I think you've got to get a parent guarantee. I always say that a parent, it's like my wonderful daughter. If she needs money, she sends me an email. She's got a parent guarantee. She's got, a, she's got liquidity. She just sends an email. Well, if the parent is kind of weak like me sometimes, maybe it's not quite so good. It depends on the parent, These, you know, ultimately. But the letter of credit, of course, is from the bank. That should be better than cash, basically. Okay, enough of that. I'm bad with letters of credit anyway. Debt sizing, if debt size is driven by the DSCR, if the DSCR, which means cash flow, I should put cash flow instead of DS. I'm going to even change that. I better change that. If, uh, where is this one? If is driven by cash flow and the DSCR, then... Um, then the debt is independent of the DSRA. The debt is fixed by future cash flow, not by DSRA accounts. It's future cash flow, CFADS, EBITDA taxes, working capital changes, blah, blah, blah. That's what influences the size of the debt. And if you have a bigger DSRA or a smaller DSRA, no effect, no effect, no effect, no effect. That means who's funding the DSRA? If the debt is given, it must come from equity. Ah, is that expensive? Ouch! Ouch! But if it's a debt to capital that's really driving it, and again, this is all a bunch of blurry mismatch a little bit because you probably use a DSRA, figure out how much the debt size is, then make all your adjustments to development fees, blah, 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 and then you figure out how it all comes equally, and then you look at a term sheet, doesn't seem to really matter. But if it's really debt to capital, then maybe it's funded a lot with debt. Okay, I agree with that. Now, I think they shouldn't care about whether it's debt or equity. I've already talked about that. That's, you care about if there's cash liquidity there. Don't come, why come up with some silly rules? Now, what we could do is take the very last payment we have, the very last payment, or even other payments, and make, you know, there's this issue. There's this issue of changing in the DSRA being a part of the debt service coverage ratio. And you try with your circular reference copy-paste, or you try with the iteration button, it's going to kill you. It's not easy to do with my UDF user-defined uh, 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 function, okay? But uh, um, it'll work. Okay, now in the next slide I show you. Let's see. Now I I put a, a, a I put a little example here. Now this had a 12 month debt service reserve account to make it a little more dramatic. And this is the case where you don't have any no, where you yes, you do have the DSRA be part of in sculpting the DSRA counts as the last period's cash flow, okay? You take that DSRA and you say, ah, that's my last period's cash flow. And then you go over here and you say, oh, no, 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 let's not include it. And you get about a half of a percent in the IR, maybe a little bit. It helps without any DSRA. Now, that's a 12-month DSRA, which is pretty big. You get 12%. So this having the DSRA be the last payment and using that for sculpting, that'll allow you to basically have a, a higher cash flow. And a higher cash flow means the present value of the cash flow is higher. If the present value of the cash flow is higher, you get higher debt. 
I hope we have higher debt here, 2.5 with no, uh, uh, with nothing, it's 2.583, with the DSRA it's this much, we had to do some present valuing to get it all working, it's a pain. Now, if you use the letter of credit instead of uh, DSRA, the programming is uh, horrible because you LC fees, the fees you pay, the half a percent fees you pay on a letter of credit. I should have been more clear about really what's going on here. So th again, there's no cash on your balance sheet. You've just paid a fee to a bank. You've paid a letter of credit fee somebody. The project pays that. Whether that's backed up by a parent or not is the interesting uh, thing, really. Now, if you do that and you have kind of a high leverage, if you, in this case, we, I, you see I didn't click on these things, these true and false, and this is in my sculpting class a file, which is a, whew, a painful circular reference, a very painful one. But I think an important one if you really want to be absolutely, really, really good, okay? Then you, uh, 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 the IRR increases a lot, okay? And here I put some debt service reserve language. So if you uh, go to the website, uh, sorry about this, and go to the slides, um, I will put the videos here, of course, and here, here, here is the here are the slides. Excuse me. So these uh, slides are in the the website, and you click on the little uh, slides on valuation, etc. Okay, I've got to work on that a little more. Okay, now let's uh, finish up. Okay, because. Um, because now we'll talk about a couple of other little issues, which the main one here is the IRR problem. And here, you know, if you, I hear that people will accept an IRR of 5% equity return in Germany on a project, that's not surprising. If it's got a fixed cost supported by the government, and you can get 2% on government bonds, why wouldn't you take 5%? Now, initially, when you make your project during the development period, you have all these kind of risks you can't measure with the IRR. You can't measure a probability of, of a date going wrong, I mean a permit going wrong, uh, uh, with an IRR. You have to use probability analysis for that. That's elsewhere. Now, once you finish the development period, your risk should go down, and when your risk should go down, your value should go up. Okay, and uh, so I put this stuff about early sale of the project, and that's what these yield codes really are supposed to do. Here's something when you know this is from a, a, a IRR, or they this is their their. It's so hard they don't even tell you whether it's project IRR or equity IRR. <coughs> in their financial statements, I think it's equity IR, and they say if it's, uh, here's a kind of what they do with their uh, uh, discount rates, capitalization rates, that's just like a, a multiple of the, of the uh, cash, oh, excuse me, the uh, project cash flow. Okay, this shows you how you can get the, the IRRs up. This shows you again, with these yield codes, for me, the whole lesson of the yield codes is not this growth stuff, God. It's the fact that you're selling off the low risk projects and getting a high IRR, just like you're selling one project off, you're just making an IPO instead of selling them off, okay? And then, uh, I think that's it. enough. There, I'm ending it, finally. I, did, I, I didn't really do enough on that last thing, but if you, the big question is how much does the risk go down from the development period? We know it goes down a lot from the development period to the notice of, to proceed or the, the financial close. And then it goes down in the construction 
period, depending on how much construction risk you have. If you've got a solar plant, there's not much construction risk, maybe. Maybe there's a little bit. And then after you're finished, you've got two risks checked off. They don't exist anymore. So the risk is, by definition, lower. I don't know how much lower. And then you've still got operating risk, and you might have got the starting point wrong in measuring your solar or, or the wind or the... Or, or, or the government doesn't like it after all, or, or what have you. And then after you have a few years of operation, you've got history. So your project, the risk should go down and the value should go up. But how much the risk goes down and how much the value goes up, anybody who can say that with some fancy automatic thing is, is, is a fraud, as usual. But we know it happens. And we know that the, the value is really high whether you own it or whether you sell it. It doesn't depend on you selling it. You are making a high IRR when the value, when the risk is going down. There is no doubt about it, which again says everything we do about this IRR is kind of out the window. The equity IRR is starting to be a meaningless number. Okay, enough of that. So I'm going to end this. This is the end of part four.